welcome everyone to one of the last sessions of this year's NACW, uh, where we'll be discussing a topic that has been highlighted in uh, many recent discussions about how to address climate change, uh, and that is reforestation. I'm John Remacall. I'm a senior manager at the Climate Action Reserve. Uh, before we get to introductions uh, and the discussion, uh, just have one housekeeping bit, uh, and that is just to remind people uh, in the audience. Uh, you're probably all very familiar with it at this point, but if you have any questions, you can uh, post them to the Q&A box uh, to the right of the stage and make sure you're in the sessions tab uh, and entering questions into that Q&A box rather than the event Q&A box. And with that, I'll move over to introducing uh, our panelists for today. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, as I introduce you. First, we have PJ Marshall. She is the executive director of Restore the Earth Foundation, which she founded in 2008 along with her husband, Marvin, in response to hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Together, they pioneered an initiative to bring together the private and public sectors to begin re restoration work with the name of reforesting 1 million acres in the Mississippi River Basin. Prior to founding Restore the Earth, she spent 40 years as a top strategic marketing consultant, and she also helped with fundraising for a variety of nonprofit organizations, including the Royal Ontario Museum of Toronto, the Museum of Fine Arts of Houston, and the Houston Symphony, raising a total of more than $50 million. Next, we have Eric Sprague, from the Vice President of, for, Reforest, uh, sorry, for Forest Restoration at American Forests where he oversees the implementation of the organization's large landscape forest restoration efforts across North America. In that role, he develops and tests innovation, innovative restoration techniques, implements restoration plans and strategies in American forest priority landscapes, and supports policy, policy initiatives to scale up action. Throughout his work, Eric integrates climate science to ensure America's forests adapt to a changing climate. Previously, he was at the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, where he also directed uh, forest restoration efforts, including plantings along stream corridors and the use of market-based forest conservation strategies. And finally, we have Mike Smith, managing partner of Renew West, which he founded in 2015 to connect natural and working lands to climate outcomes in carbon markets. At Renew West, he's developed the largest carbon-focused reforestation project in US history the Two Million Tree Collins Modoc Reforestation Project. He's a featured expert for a number of groups, including the US Climate Alliance, the Colorado Forest Health Advisory Council, and the Council of Western State Foresters. And prior to Renew West, Mike served as an officer in the US Navy for more than a dozen years, primarily as an FA-18 pilot across the globe, including aboard the USS Kitty Hawk. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Now, before uh, we get really into the discussion, I just wanted to set the stage very briefly. And let me pull up one quick visual. So there have been some studies led by the Nature Conservancy in recent years at different scales that have helped to highlight the role reforestation can, play, reforestation can play in combating climate change relative to other nature-based climate solutions. And I realize it might be difficult to see uh, all of the, the text on these charts, but the, the take-home point is that the top bar on each of the charts is uh, reforestation uh, with the studies finding that at both the US scale and the global scale, reforestation has the largest potential for uh, mitigating climate change. And as we've heard in several discussions during the conference, removals are becoming recognized more and more as a necessary strategy for achieving climate goals, with reforestation being the nature-based removal approach featured perhaps the most. So we have a huge potential supply of carbon removals from reforestation, paired with accelerating demand for such removals. And today's panel is going to discuss some of the issues around rising to the challenge before us when it comes to helping ensure reforestation efforts can be used effectively as a climate action at a broad scale. 
So with that, Eric, I'd like to turn to you first. There are, and sorry, let me pause my screen sharing so we can see everyone. So there are a lot of reforestation initiatives that have cropped up in recent years, perhaps most prominently 1T.org. Uh, I was hoping you could tell us about American Forest's involvement with 1T.org and what are the opportunities and challenges presented by it, as well as, uh, I guess, address how carbon markets relate to what 1T.org is hoping to accomplish, uh, and perhaps separately to what American Forest is hoping to accomplish. You bet. Thanks, John. And it's great to be here with you today. And uh, nice to see you, PJ and Mike, as well. You're right, John. So reforestation is definitely having a moment right now. And I, I think that's being driven by a few key things. You highlighted one, the Nature Conservancy uh, paper on uh, nature-based solutions. America's forests and forest products currently offset 15% of our annual greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. That study showed we could nearly double that by implementing actions like reforestation. So huge potential there. Um, Additionally, the IPCC found that carbon removal will be necessary to meet and maintain the Paris 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, warming threshold. So there's increasing awareness that we have to reduce emissions, but also pull more carbon out of the atmosphere. It's not an either or. And so I think this awareness is, is sort of driving a lot of this, this interest in, in reforestation. And then you also mentioned the government corporate net zero commitments are increasingly looking to net zero, uh, sorry, looking to carbon removal projects to help them meet their goals. And, I think it's because reforestation is an easy project type to communicate to your stakeholders and the additionality for products can be clear to demonstrate. So there's a lot of interest in, in trying to figure out uh, how reforestation fits into this picture. And so to harness this momentum and, and to bring the Trillion Trees movement together, the World Economic Forum launched 1T.org in 2020. The initiative is to conserve, restore, and grow. And that's important to note. It's not just about planting trees, but it's also recognizing we must protect the trees we have now, implement implement restoration actions to achieve a variety of uh, environmental and social outcomes, and then grow trees um, where, it's, where it makes sense. So a trillion trees globally by 2030. And the vision of 1T.org is to do this by unifying and elevating the collective impact of governments, companies, civil society NGOs, like the Girl Scouts, philanthropies, and, and other actors. The US chapter of 1T.org uh, was launched in August of 2020, and is now being co-led by American Forest and the World Economic Forum. Since the launch, we've had around 50 pledges uh, to conserve, restore, and grow billions of trees by 2030. So it's been very exciting uh, to, to kick it off so far. Pledges have been made by a diversity of actors, including governments like your state, John, of Wisconsin, city of Boise, Idaho, uh, companies like Salesforce and Bank of America, and NGOs like Girl Scouts and the American Forest Foundation and Restore the Earth Foundation. One of the first questions I think was asked most about 1T.org as it got going was, are there even space for all these trees? You know, what, what is the real opportunity here? So American Forest teamed up with the Nature Conservancy and we recently launched reforestationhub.org to help communicate opportunities in the United States. The hub shows 133 million acres of reforestation potential um, across the country. This is space for, for 68 billion trees. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of trees. The opportunity can be sorted through the tool by ownership and land type like within existing forests, pasture, floodplains, and wildlife corridors. It's a huge amount, but we all know from, from working on the ground that a real opportunity depends on a lot of other factors um, than just availability of, of land. You know, you've got to meet landowners' goals, you've got to be able to get to the site and, um, to, to have a re reforestation crew get out there and do the planting. But we do think the tool is really helpful when you think from a government or a regional organization perspective on how to think about where opportunities exist in your area, and then how would you consider different incentives and approaches? For example, you might find that pasture land is a, is a key area. And so you gotta tailor how you're gonna engage with, uh, with producers and working lands owners to, to figure out how to make it, make it work for them. And so if, if, if there was enough space was the first question, then certainly the second question was, where will all those trees come from? So American Forest has teamed up with the Nature Conservancy, along with many scientists and nursery professionals from across the country, to assess the potential for the reforestation pipeline, uh, the entire pipeline from collecting seed to post planting monitoring to scale up and meet this massive demand. We found that if, if we set a goal to meet half of that 68 tree billion potential, so 34 billion trees by 2040, nurseries would have to produce an additional 1.8 billion seedlings each year. America's tree nurseries currently produce 1.3 billion seedlings annually, so this requires more than a doubling of, of current capacity. 
I think the good news is that existing nurseries, when we reached out to them, said they have the ability to scale up and we could potentially meet 80% of that need just by enhancing the extra space they're not using now. But to produce those extra seedlings would require implementing a couple of strategies. One is enhanced regional sharing of, nurse, of nursery capacity and two, building new nurseries. Regional sharing is important. 90% of the ability to increase nursery capacity is located in just two regions, the South and Pacific Northwest. Um, so we need to have figure out how some regions can support planting efforts in other regions by using their own, their own uh, existing infrastructure. And then new nurseries will be needed in locations like the Northeast and Southwest that have high reforestation opportunities, but low ability to increase capacity. For nurseries to invest in scaling up infrastructure, including adding to their workforce or building new greenhouses, they need to see consistent and long-term demand signals. They need to know there's gonna be funding for tree planting for a long time. Um, initiatives like 1T.org can be really helpful in doing this. And, and one of the reasons why I'm really excited about uh, 1T.org. We currently have a reforestation and policy working group uh, that are working through some of these large scale barriers to reforestation like nursery capacity and hope we can continue to work together to sort of implement and pilot uh, new strategies in the, in the coming year to, to two years. And then give the attention of carbon removal to, to companies and governments. Carbon finance can also be an important tool to scaling up reforestation. Another way to send a demand signal to nurseries and, and project developers um, that there's funding here. Um, but of course, while reforestation is recognized as an important carbon removal practice, it's hard to make pencil out uh, with existing offset programs, particularly at scale. Um, there's some good examples out there, but to meet the huge need we have, I think some innovations are going to be important. So the 1T.org also has a carbon finance group where you've got big companies um, getting together to talk about this along with the U.S. Forest Service and states and nonprofits to figure out well, how can we work together to innovate in this space and create new opportunities that will bring the funding um, that we need to, to scale up reforestation. Then I'll, then I'll close by saying in parallel, American Forest has been collaborating with the Climate Action Reserve and other red registries on new approaches to financing restoration too. Uh, these include CLAR's Climate Forward Program and similar efforts by Vera and, and the Gold Standard. And based on the market research that we've conducted over the past couple of months, we think there's space for programs that offer buyers the ability to claim progress towards meeting net zero commitments in the short term after financing projects, and then report on that over time as carbon sequestered, uh, is carbon sequestered in the project and as a project develops. We're building some pilot projects now and hope to have some progress to share later this year. If anyone's interested in learning or talking more or, or figuring out how to work together on this, we'd love to love to talk some uh, here or, or down the road. So thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, you mentioned the issue of seedling supply and I'm, I'm wondering if there's been any discussion, I guess, within the 1T.org community in particular about other ways to address uh, that issue in particular, you know, thinking about some of the innovations that are out there, like I'm sure uh, we've all heard of the company Drone Seed. Uh, and so rather than worrying about producing seedlings and having those available, maybe uh, pointing more towards some of these innovative techniques that might be able to use that can uh, provide some relief in that sense. Yeah, we, we need all, all of the above uh, solutions. So certainly that's something that's come up a lot. Um, you know, I talked a lot about the, the ability for nurseries and sales to scale up, but across the entire reforestation pipeline, we've got needs. And one is seed collection. Um, existing stores for seed uh, just isn't sufficient even to meet really our, 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 our current planned reforestation. But particularly if you're thinking about climate adapted seed or, or seed that might be better adapted to future conditions, we've got a real challenge with that. And so whatever, whether you're using drone seed or using drones, um, We've got to figure that part out too uh, through some innovative partnerships and uh, new funding sources. But yeah, I, I do agree with you that where that makes sense and um, where it can fit into a broad suite of reforestation techniques, that's going to be critical. There have been some other interesting things being, being thought about too when we think about the ultimate success of, of tree planting. You know, how, how do we improve survivorship, particularly in areas with, with drought and other conditions that are, are going to be exacerbated by climate change in the coming years? Um, there's some folks at New Mexico State University have been experimenting with research ideas of, you know, when a tree's, you know, being germinated and growing in a nursery, they give it some tough love and stress it a little bit. So when it's outplanted, it's better able to deal with those conditions. So I think finding the seed, trying new planting techniques, um, new research is all going to be an important part of the puzzle. Great. Thanks for that. PJ, I want to turn to you next. 
Um, I was hoping you could tell us how Restore the Earth came to view reforestation as a climate mitigation opportunity, and how has conducting reforestation with that as one of the goals shaped or even changed how you approach such activities, in particular as new carbon market opportunities have emerged? Well, I mean, it, we, we kind of um, got involved in the carbon area by uh, tripping into it. I mean, we spent most of our time responding to disasters and uh, generating uh, funding and matching public, fun private funding and matching public funding to respond to restorations following disasters and restoring whether it was forest or wetland forests that had been um, destroyed by these natural disasters. And we stayed away from carbon because we had uh, gotten involved a little bit in the carbon scenarios that happened around 2008 and, and found that a lot of folks were still um, hurting from some bad experiences related to carbon. But actually, since most of our funding comes from corporate funding partners, it was our corporate funding partners that began to uh, regenerate the discussion and the concept of um, focusing their investment in reforestation to not only restore critical e ecosystems, but to generate uh, carbon emission reductions that they could capitalize on as it related to uh, the voluntary market. So that honestly has only taken place probably in the last three years. We are prior to that time, you know, we didn't even talk about carbon. And we, at, we fortunately were able about the same timing to look at carbon, not only as the most uh, cost effective, simple approach to uh, getting uh, carbon emission reduction projects on the ground through reforestation, but water became a really hot topic as well with our corporate partners. And so we were able to combine uh, the additional co-benefits that are generated by reforestation with the, for instance, the carbon water nexus, as well as looking at the additional co-benefits uh, from an environmental, social, and economic standpoint and the amount of impact that these reforestation uh, projects were happening, not only related to climate, but, you know, related to um, habitat, um, eco, you know, restoration of the the ecosystems, the impacts on communities, and that they could all be, this reforestation was really re, uh, bringing together co-benefits that were a benefit to all of these stakeholders in self-sustaining systems. So looking at it from that standpoint, then um, not only was carbon now driving uh, additional investment into reforestation, but folks were actually looking across the board at all of the co-benefits that were being brought to the table and the values created by reforestation. Great, thanks PJ. Uh, I can turn to you now. Um, your company has had a more direct focus on linking uh, reforestation to carbon markets from the get-go, with your work spanning reforestation on both private and public lands. Where have you seen the biggest opportunities for reforestation as a climate mitigation action? And have there been any policies or programs that have especially limited or helped your ability to capitalize on those opportunities? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. And it's good to see uh, uh, you as well, uh, PJ and Eric. Um, you know, the, the first thing to do is, is to kind of break down who the landowners are. Um, and it breaks into three large categories, essentially the federal government, large industrial timber holders and small private landowners. And they all have their own challenges and, and constraints. And there are other landowner types out there, you know, state public, for example. Um, but like if you're looking for the biggest opportunities, it's in those areas. And when you um, think about their their needs and what's been happening, uh, the Goldilocks solution right now has been the large industrial timber owners. Uh, the largest landowner, the biggest opportunity is the federal government, and they have millions of acres and, and billions of trees that need to get planted, but um, for a lot of reasons, just haven't been. Um, and in the small landowners, there's a, a certain degree of, of 
uh, inability and lack of, of capacity to do the work. Um, and so, uh, like I said, the Goldilocks solution has been in the, the, the large industrial timber owners. But like the biggest restriction is not really like the landowner problem. It's, I, in my opinion, um, it's, uh, it's old thinking. And when we talk about like the Fargioni paper, um, which, you know, the Na natural climate solutions for the United States, it, it like pretty clearly highlights that natural and working lands, the biggest opportunity there is on reforestation as, and as Eric mentioned, that's 68 billion trees. Um, there are billions of trees to be planted and we're only planting a few million a year. Like we're just, we're off by orders of magnitude for where we need to be and it needs to scale very, very rapidly. Um, and the scale's huge and it's only getting, not only just getting bigger, it's accelerating. Um, and there's some great work happening here, uh, like, you know, what PJ and Eric have already talked about. Um, the Forest Climate Working Group has supported some bills in Congress for funding federal land work, for example. Um, but waiting on the government's kind of putting all of our eggs in a pretty shaky basket. Um, and philanthropic capital, again, doing great work in the space. We're, we're off by orders of magnitude. They just, we can't get there from here just relying on philanthropic. So I think there absolutely has to be a market solution to it um, because the scale of the problem is just too big. And so as Eric said, we need to innovate and we need to innovate rapidly. Um, and we need to get past like the entrenched thinking and the scar tissue kind of associated with the old fights that we had um, because it's getting in the way of our growth as an industry. Um, so a couple of examples of entrenched thinking that I talk about here, um, you know, starting with the landowners, one is like the federal government. Um, they're mostly still focused on turning tax dollars into forest outcomes. Um, and if we move the, the, that's a pretty big lever if you can get it moving. Um, but right now, again, it's not, uh, it's anything but guaranteed. Um, but they do have existing authorities, um, where they could allow market opportunities to, to occur, but they're not really willing to use them. Um, because they're, they're pretty small C conservative worried about, uh, getting a little too far over those legal authorities. Um, and I think that there's a way that, you know, the federal government could reimagine that, you know, when I think about large timber, um, the gold, like my Goldilocks, um, with the Collins timber company, um, they're still pretty much focused on cutting trees. Um, and I think that there's a lot of stakeholder pressure to do that. Um, especially after, you know, the experiences of the timber wars of the late eighties and early nineties. Um, but I think the, the large timber is also kind of setting themselves up for a similar problem, which is, is not adapting to a new reality, which is, is that we're all in the carbon business. Um, and timber is a component of that, but like we're, we're, we're in the climate change business and we need to start thinking about it that way. And then when I think about like smaller landowners and about they're kind of at the, the whim of some larger market forces, uh, COVID is, you know, putting pressure on people to move into the, into the, 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 the countryside a little bit more as well there. Um, but, you know, some of the stuff that's happening there is, is as, uh, for example, is, as TMOs convert lands into a highest and best use mindset, what they're really doing is introducing additional fragility into the system uh, because they're adding more sources of ignition for fire. Um, and they're also weakening the ability of the system to respond uh, should there be a fire because it's, it's, it's a fragmented landscape. Um, now, there's opportunities for all of that uh, as well. Um, you know, some of the like the, the entrenched thinking is I see is kind of in the broader marketplace, which is around um, ex ante versus ex post crediting. And I think that's um, I think that's really more of a side debate because it's missing the bigger threat to market legit legitimacy, which is um, that we're there's a lot of funding that's going to projects that to the public don't seem to very change much. It's really just kind of moving around some legal paperwork rather than actually putting trees in the earth. Um, and that, you know, that's, I think to me is the biggest threat to the legitimacy of, of offsets broadly and forced offsets, um, is, is that, you know, it feels a little bit like a shell game and we need to respond to that. Now, so the, the progress that I talked about is around like, uh, climate forward, uh, for example, out of, uh, out of, uh, out of the reserve or, uh, the EFCUs out of Vera, like that's starting to, to get the ball moving there. Um, and I think that's great because one of the things it does is it changes the economics around it and, and reforestation. It's always been plant the trees, wait a couple of decades, maybe, uh, hopefully the market's still around and you'll get your offsets and then everybody will be great. And, uh, that's just not doing the, the action that the climate and the public re require. And so by changing that structure, that's good. But, um, you know, I think that puts an undue pressure on the registries, uh, frankly, which is that I don't think that we're all creatively working together to, to solve the problem. Like the registries are, are doing this work, but we're leaving them pretty darn exposed. Um, and so, um, you know, so there's that. 
I don't want to like poo poo where we've been because we, you know, we've established forestry as the offset to buy, right? You know, improved forest management offsets are, you know, the majority of the marketplace. People put a value on them. But if we keep looking back at where we've been, like, I don't think we're going to get to where we need to be going. Um, you know, so just to brag about Collins here, which is, is that they were willing to kind of take a leap of faith with us. Um, and they were willing to believe that timber and the environment didn't need to be adversarial. And that's that's been all the difference in the world. And it doesn't have to be. It isn't, um, again, because Collins and every other timber company are in the carbon business now. Um, I think that, you know, we have an opportunity created just by the existence of the WCI and the California carbon market, which kind of kept, um, as PJ was talking in the 2008 to 2014, 15 timeframe, kept like the, the dream of the carbon market alive. Right. Um, so, you know, there's a debt of gratitude for that. Um, you know, I think the biggest opportunity in the short term is the public demand and the voluntary market buyers. Um, they're not satisfied with just uh, with paying somebody else to reduce their emissions that just, you know, especially in a, in a, in a, in a world that has to go to zero, paying somebody else to not emit is, is pretty dissatisfying. Um, but I would say like the, ultimately the biggest opportunity is, is just the scale of the problem and the necessity of what we're offering. There's just no path to our climate future without massive reforestation. And we're all in that business. Great. Thanks, Mike. You'd mentioned uh, the opportunity that public ownerships present. Uh, and I know PJ and Eric, you both work uh, on public lands. And I wonder if you have any additional comments to make around either your experience uh, working with uh, government agencies uh, to try to get reforestation efforts up and running, uh, or if you have um, specific experience related to uh, trying to get public lands involved in carbon projects in particular too. I'm going to talk, I, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I was going to talk about it from two different uh, aspects. So what so we have uh, one path that we're involved in with a, a, a couple of states and through state agencies where in particular in Louisiana, where we have a contractual agreement with the state of Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries that any reforestation that we bring to the table with them uh, on their property, and they own like 1.6 million acres, that um, that reforestation put in place on their land, um, restore the earth is assigned all the green attributes to, um, based on the on the the success of the reforestation of those sites at which we can then assign to investors who have invested with us in the reforestation so what that's been able to do is give us the opportunity to bring private funding to the table in this public partnership get a lot of reforestation on the on the private on the public lands with permanent conservation easements and generate very high quality uh, carbon emission reductions um, on re on successful reforested lands. Our other re our other relationships, which are tremendously strong, is when we first started out in responding to disasters. It was the NRCS that actually actually brought us to the table along the Gulf Coast back in um, 2005 and um, actually was a partner with us in generating some of the public funding um, that matched the private funding that we brought to the table to start getting reforestation on the ground. And it was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NRCS working with us over probably a, a seven or eight uh, year period of time that actually brought to the table this million acre project in the Mississippi River. I know a lot of people talk about their million acre project in the Mississippi River Basin, but US Fish and Wildlife and NRCS actually brought their research um, to us and the identification and uh, prioritizing of degraded lands in the floodplain that they had been studying for over 12 years that were losing not uh, not uh, 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 topsoil, 
but sediment that was allowing nutrients to flow into the tributaries and down into the Gulf Coast. So these multiple dynamics. So working with them, they actually have brought to the table all of the, the identified and prioritized private lands um, that we can tap into that are much above and beyond the million acres that we're talking about. They also brought to us the the project in business model for being able to deliver on the uh, reforestation by us bringing private investment to the table. They've, they've basically held our hand to um, not only provide public matching funding for the, the uh, our private public matching funding to our private investment that we've brought to the table, but they've also worked very closely with us and we we actually do have um, a bill that was uh, put in place two weeks ago from the uh, it's a house bill 2606 and it's called the sustains act where they the agencies recommended that we look at modifying an existing law that would help provide for large amounts of of public funding in the future. So our relationships with the, the public sector has been very strong from the beginning, but we had to bring our part to the table. So we didn't come to them with open hands asking for public funding. We came with private funding in hand, looking at ways for us to work together in a collaborative way to match it and amplify the kind of work that could be done. Yeah, John, I appreciate you asking that question. I, I, uh, one reason why is I think it raises an important point about reforestation we haven't talked about just yet. State and federal governments are excited about carbon finance. They need it. There's the, the need they have on the ground is massive and they do not have the resources to, to do it. Um, of course, trees have evolved for hundreds of millions of years. They, they have their strategies for, for regrowing, regrowing, but the rules of the game have changed. Climate change is, is vastly influencing the ability of forests to respond to disturbances like wildfire. Fires are burning so hot and so large that we're losing those seed bearing trees. And even in some places like the Sierra Nevada, there's threat that those events will lead to a long-term conversion type from forest to, to chaparral or other, other habitat types. And so there's real concern about this, but they don't have the resources. You know, when it, you think about, a lot of people equate reforestation with with getting the cut out. Um, and that does work. The Forest Service and states have methodologies for, you know, when you do harvest timber, you generate some revenue that goes back into to reforesting post, post harvest. Um, there are mandates to make sure that they're restocking the forest um, post harvest. There are not mandates for post disturbance for the US Forest Service, for example. Um, there are not dedicated funding sources for the Forest Service um, post disturbance to, um, to respond. And it's really important because 80% of the reforestation need on forest service land is driven by wildfire. So the, the needs are massive. And so they are interested. We are talking to states and, and, and different national forests and, and the forest service in Washington about this. There are some challenges. Um, and I hear from states too, that the carbon rights are not like, you know, oil and gas where they can lease. Um, so there's some legislative or policy issues that need to be worked through. I mean, this gets to what Mike is saying too. We need to, to figure out some of these out quickly because there are opportunities there, the need is there. Um, we just, we're getting tripped up in paper on this. And I think there's some strategies that we can we can do to, to get around that. Um, so thanks for the question. Yeah. And uh, kind of coming off that to your comments, does the, do you think the new administration in Washington provides some opportunities to, to perhaps move more quickly on, on some of those issues around uh, carbon rights and because I know that's the, you know it's an issue that we grapple with as a registry is figuring out how we can uh, get projects onto public lands, but that's that's a big stumbling block um, as I know you're aware of. So yeah, uh, we certainly hope so, and I'd love to hear Mike and PJ's experience in this too. Um, that I think that, that they understand these issues, the administration. So I think they're willing to try to work to try to figure this out. The devil's in the details, but I. I, I want to I want to move and, and learn as we go. I think the, a pilot project approach would be really helpful to demonstrate how we can figure out how credits could flow through a registry, be retired without transferring ownership, or maybe there are other policy policy fixes um, that USDA could come up with 
But I think I'd love to try to figure that out as we go um, because the moment moment is so urgent and the, the, the opportunity is, is so big right now. Mike or PJ, do you have any any comments that you want to add? Well, I know that they're I know that they're open. I mean, I'm I'm not we don't work a lot on federal lands. Uh, but getting federal matching funding, I mean, obviously some of these issues and concerns potentially could come into play. Um, and again, I, I, I'd like, I'm going to promote this folks to look into this, uh, bipartisan, uh, sustain at house bill 2606, which is, was put forth by GT Thompson, um, and has bipartisan support uh, both in the House and in the Senate. And the language in it actually addresses being able to sell these offsets on the, on the open market, um, you know, and have, uh, have them, it, it, it has language that addresses some of the issues that we've all been concerned about. So it's these kinds of small baby steps moving forward. In particular, we've got a very receptive administration right now. If we can all support these kinds of baby steps, um, well, actually it's not a baby step, it could be major, but these kinds of steps moving forward, I, and they can see uh, successful projects demonstrated on the ground, I think we're gonna make some big um, strides forward. I think I'd agree with that. Um, you know, so Renew West is a, uh, is, we have a MOU with the US Forest Service on carbon reforestation. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, we had proposed uh, a, a few pilot projects um, under the previous administration. And like I talked about, like there were some that were willing to kind of, to in different levels of the organization that were willing to, to go out and give this a try. And then there were others at higher levels that weren't. Um, and, you know, higher levels are closer to the political problem. Um, and so I think there was a concern about talk cover um, and uh, whether there's explicit authorities coming through. And I know that there's been some folks that have been working with that in, in the various committees and the Senate and the House. Um, whether those come through or not, I think that there's also like an informal, like uh, they're not worried about like, um, you know, if, if they're to, to stick their neck out a little bit more. Um, and that I think that, uh, that at a minimum could start with a, a couple of pilot projects. But, you know, again, my concern is always, which is, uh, you know, thankfully the, the administration announced a, you know, a, a 50 to 52% emissions reduction by the end of, uh, end of the decade that we don't really get there without uh, forestry, you know, scaling up in, in that part. And my worry is, is that pilot projects will take too, too long as well. Um, that, you know, a couple of years, let's do a pilot project, plan it up. You know, next thing we know, we're in the second half of the decade you know, we, we've got some problems there. So we're kind of getting beyond the point of pilot projects is my worry, um, but um, I'll, I'll take that over nothing. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and I see we've had a number of questions come up. Um, so maybe I'll just pose one quick question to all three of you uh, for just a relatively brief response, and then we can turn to some of the questions from the audience. Um, and I guess we, we've all seen that there's been a pretty big focus on reforestation, but there's also been a, a healthy amount of skepticism and even pushback to the use of reforestation as a climate solution. Um, you know, with some of that pushback being around the potential adverse impacts uh, that reforestation can, can result in, such as reductions in water supplies, the removal of land from cultivation in areas where agricultural production uh, might still be important, uh, or even the ecological inappropriateness of planting monocultures, if that's what a reforestation effort is doing. So I'm wondering if, uh, if what your responses are to the, that, those yeah. kinds of criticisms. Yeah, I, I'd say I've seen it all as well. And some of it's pretty healthy, good questions to be asking, and some of it is just contrary. I think a lot of the folks in this, in this space are used to that anyway. Um, you know, Mike, PJ, American Forest, folks in one team are not advocating for you know, planting prairie, which is right. We're, we're advocating for the right tree in the right place. Let's do it with the right science to make sure we're, we're planning for the future in the right ways. Um, it's about recognizing the role of reforestation and all the benefits they provide. And 
um, we think it's a great opportunity. And if it's done right, the right way, um, and that's how we're doing it, it's going to have huge, huge benefits. It's not a silver bullet. I mentioned that. It's We've got to reduce emissions, too. Um, but when you look to nature-based solutions, it's a great one. And I think, to, you know, to, to just sort of, I think someone, someone noted to, to poo-poo it in the, in the comments here, Bill Gates saying that. And I think that's I think that's a bit silly, right? There's a lot of benefits. We're not saying it's going to solve every problem, but um, we'd be silly not to not to chase after this one. Yeah, I might add that uh, there is no to, to echo Eric's uh, language there. There is no silver bow, bullet, uh, but uh, there is a silver buckshot is a phrase that I heard the other day. You have to do a lot. We there is no one thing we have to do. We have to do many things, and we have to do them all. Uh, reforestation is a component of that. Um, in Ultimately, what we're doing is planting forests to absorb carbon, not for the next decade, but for the decade after um, and the decade after that. And so this is something that we're investing in the future. And that's always what reforestation is. Um, so, but when you think about the, the investing in the future part, which that starts bringing up some kind of stickier questions um, and to, is we need to be thinking about forest systems and making sure that we're you know, managing for biodiversity and habitat, water outcomes, et cetera. But we also need to be thinking about what those forces of the future are going to be. Um, and right now there's a lot of talk, especially in the West, about returning the, the landscape to kind of a pre-fire uh, management landscape, a 1900 landscape. And I think that's half the question. The other half of the question really though is, is what's it, it, is what's it going to be in 2100? Um, and so some of those things, we're, we're now on a, a, a big global experiment about how we're all going to re react. And so some of the stuff that we're seeing in there is around how can we genetically modify certain tree types in order to be more climate adaptable um, or assisted migration for, hey, the forest that was here before is not gonna be the forest that'll be here in the future post a, a disturbance and we need to, to be managing for that. And that starts putting in some kind of uncomfortable questions. Um, but the, the flip side of it is, is if we don't do anything about it, then there will be no forest um, and there will be a lot of negative environmental outcomes associated with that. And so, uh, we just need to, to have a little bit of um, good faith about like where where we want this all to go. And, and I think that, you know, the more that we have organizations like Trillion Trees and and others really showcasing the good projects, you know, the 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 troubled projects have been showcased a lot globally. But being able to really showcase the real excellent, good, thoughtful, long-term, permanent, you know, um, uh, impactful projects, that's all our responsibility too as we move forward. But that, that education and awareness is something the more people know, you know, the better informed, informed they are, then the more that they have the, the potential of better understanding. Um, the impacts of a really good project on the ground. Great. Thanks to all of you for your responses there. Uh, so let's turn to some of the, the questions that have been posed by the audience. And I think I'll try to get through as many of these as we can. We've got about 15 minutes left still. Um, Eric, I'm going to, there was one posted uh, specifically asking you if you could elaborate on your comment around carbon financing uh, and the idea of claiming progress short term. Yeah, so obviously, you know, the space we're in now, things are developing fast. And I, there's an interesting conversation to have be had about, you know, companies, governments are gonna keep planting trees. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, and then there's reforestation based offsets and how these two bleed together and what counts in, in what framework and what doesn't count in another framework. It's gonna be interesting to, um, to see play out over time. Um, but the way we see it is we think there's potential for early financing come in, like with the Climate Forward Program, um, that because we're looking towards the future um, for planned planned emissions, that it should be reasonable that a, a company could claim that they're making progress toward those net zero commitments by that investment. Um, the, in both with Climate Forward and, and other um, project types that are out there, those can convert eventually to a more formal carbon offset where then it can be more formally reported in a system. I think there's even space to think about that too. When can you report something? Does it have to be a verified emission reduction? Can it be part of an, an ex-ante credit uh, with a lot of um, risk management built around it? I think that space is ripe for, for conversation. And I think um, that's kind of what Mike and I and, and others are talking about here. We need to start getting this on the ground and, and seeing how they develop and, and figure this out as we go. I do know 
we, we should begin thinking about, and I, I get this credit to, to Carr thinking on this, is that we should be advancing things that I think we as a community think we, we need um, and not just wait around for, um, you know, a standard body or other folks tell us what we, what they think is what our project should look like. Let's, let's, let's get it out there. Let's show them how we think we can develop a, a rigorous project. And hopefully that leads into how those standards are developed over, over time. Great. Thanks, Eric. And that, that kind of leads into uh, the next question, too. Uh, and that is, um, do you agree offset credit programs can help to scale up reforestation? Obviously, we've seen that in the California compliance market. Reforestation hasn't been very popular because of the economics that we've kind of touched on already. Um, and, you know, as registries, we are trying to develop standards that will hopefully uh, incentivize the development of projects. Uh, but given the urgency of the need, uh, I guess, how big of a role do you see offset markets potentially playing uh, when it comes to reforestation? And that's for any to take. Well, I'm going to say I think they're important. I mean, we're we're um, we're not just talking to corporations. We're talking about big. We're talking with big um, investment groups about investing in these large projects because they see the the offset markets they see the opportunity for you know being engaged and want to be engaged whether it's carbon or you know water is not as developed yet but you know they see it down the road i mean i think it i think it's a big driver i would agree with that in our discussions we're and i'm sure Eric this up there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines uh mostly just looking for projects um and so the the bottleneck has been in uh, development capacity um and uh land availability really um and so that that capital's sitting on the sidelines um you know the other thing that i would say here is is that um the i mean ultimately what we need to drive out here is, a, is a, it's a question of social license um, and so um, when you're talking about uh, these, these, the reason that these, um, these in institutional investors and, and others are, are getting into the space is because they're seeing that social license for operating in an emitting capacity is, is fading. Um, and you you see that a little bit in Corsia. That's why Shell got so big into reforestation because they want to be able to, to um, you know, to, to be able to, to continue to operate to a certain extent. And we emit globally 40 billion tons of emissions per year. Uh, only about 20% of that can be offset through 100% utilization of natural and working lands. That means that roughly for every, you know, four emission, or for every ton, four tons, or for every one ton that we sequester, there's at, at least another four tons that are gonna be left holding the bag. And people are just done with accepting that like a, a, a positive emissions is, is going to be a continued business model. And so when you talk about social license, you know, we really envision it where in order to continue operating as a large company, you're going to have to own a forest you're going to, and you're going to have to have been involved in its replanting, whether you physically own the land uh, or whether you own the rights to the reforestation and it was on public lands or whatever the case may be, you know, that's that's the next step for the carbon markets. And it, um, in my opinion, is, is that we start pairing up the long term production with the long term emissions. Um, similar to like what power purchase agreements did in the uh, in the the renewable energy space. And anyways, back to the question. I think that's massively scalable as we see yeah. with uh, with renewable energy. Just a couple quick thoughts on it too is that I think around 50% of the gross domestic product is um, with companies and corporations that have net zero commitments. Um, carbon renewables, we, remember we talked about are becoming a big part of those commitments too. Eight, a study prepared for the UN showed that the carbon removal market could be close to 800, 800 billion dollars by 2050. So I think there's huge potential as we focus on carbon removal um, and we just got to figure out some of these financing challenges with reforestation and that could be a huge part of it because of the advantages that we, we've talked about with reforestation has over some other project types. Great, thanks. Another question we had uh, coming in is, how should a project developer of an FMU, so a climate forward reforestation project, describe the vintage of FMUs to help a corporate buyer understand, understand how an FMU fits into its net zero commitments? Um, yeah, I, I'm guessing 
any one of you might be able to respond to that. And I'll just throw in just a little bit here too, in that um, with the quantification tool that we've developed at the reserve for reforestation projects re registering under Climate Forward, uh, we're going to be building in the ability to actually, under the projections that we use uh, under that tool, you'll, you'll be able to figure out how many uh, tons have essentially been sequestered by a given year out into the future from based on the project start date. So I'll just throw that out there, but uh, I think the question remains for, for any of you to take on um, from the audience question. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm glad you jumped in, John, because I was going to direct it to you. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's going to be a key part of how the registries pull us, pull us together and help us think it through, too. But the way we think about it is, you know, companies making a net zero commitment by 2030 or 2040. Um, they've got a certain um, emission reductions they're looking for, a certain percentage, and then FMUs sort of can become a, a part of that thinking of over the next 10, 20 years, how they're going to do that, right? So it's a forward-looking approach. Um, from the time that the project's developed, or it could be the, the year of development or a year after the project's been, um, been implemented. Yeah, and, and we've, we've done the same thing in that the corporations that we're working with, they're looking at their future emissions. And so this is, you know, accommodating and uh, helping them to comply for their future emissions. So, you know, it's, it's something that everyone has had to get comfortable with because it's been new, but and looking at uh, it being a part of their core, their carbon uh, portfolio, you know, it's beginning to resonate that that's allowing them to really um, accommodate and comply with their future mission reductions. Yeah, I would just say that uh, FMUs, um, even though there's that 10 year accounting component in there that I think needs to be addressed. Um, when I look at FMUs, I think of it as more as a forward contract uh, rather than as a vintage. And depending on the developer, I think, you know, our approach to this too is with all of our projects have permanent conservation easements on it, not 20 or 30 years, they're permanent 100 year conservation easements on it. And um, we are looking, are monitoring and accounting for the, uh, the reductions are long term, they're not, they're not short term. So we have continuous monitoring going on much past the required uh, monitoring commitment right now and people feel more comfortable with that because understanding the permanence and that yes this is going to be monitored and addressed over a long period of time yep. great thanks uh, next question we have is what are some of the obstacles to encouraging forest pro projects uh, for example easements and permanency requirements and what are some of the policy or, policy or legal contractual innovations that may overcome these kinds of obstacles? Anyone wish to take, take that one on? Yeah, so what we've been thinking through a lot um, has been sort of risk management through, through these approaches. Of course, force change uh, throughout their lifetimes. Um, they burn, ceilings burn. You've seen that happen, of course. Um, so how do you build in the structures that um, can handle that and deal that and provide that risk management that the buyers will need? So that's one thing we've been thinking a lot about is, you know, what the appropriate strategy for that is building a buffer pool or other insurance types that we're thinking a lot, a lot through right now. Yeah, and, and, and then the easement, from an easement standpoint, and uh, again, one of the, so um, looking at how, uh, the public matching funds and then other public technical assistance and engagement can provide for some of these long-term permanent easements where there have been restrictions on the amount of funding that was available uh, to be able to provide for these easements. We're involved right now in, in, in again, in, and actually Restore the Earth just received a uh, RCPP award for 7.4 million that's that's matched with 7.4 million in private funding. That is looking at it is the pilot to look at being able to provide funding from other sources for these permanent conservation easements, you know, opening up uh, these carbon credits to be sold on the open market for corporations to be able to brand 
um, forested projects. So with getting these kinds of pilots on the ground and finding ways of being innovative for providing additional funding to address some of these additional issues. Um, again, we've got to get our, we've got, we've got to show that these projects can successfully be delivered with this kind of innovation. Um, I might just add that, you know, just some basic nuts and bolts for people that aren't uh, as familiar with reforestation. Uh, it doesn't require an easement on a lot of protocols, um, but it does highly incent it um, where you get a lower buffer pool. Um, so you get more production, especially in the climate forward stuff. There's some real values for uh, doing easements because you get some more permanence. Um, so uh, it's worth thinking about that. Um, you know, the other thing I would throw in here is, is uh, and you know, kind of my role with the Climate Alliance, U.S. Climate Alliance, is that the various states have their own uh, carbon outcomes that they're looking to achieve. And so uh, when you start looking at these projects, um, it's not there yet, but it's coming, um, which is, is that the states themselves may want to go ahead and claim some of the carbon outcomes themselves. Um, and so uh, you may have potential restrictions for exporting the reductions, the offsets uh, out of state um, is, is potential. And you, like five years ago, Brazil did something very similar to that before everything went wacky down there. Um, but, um, or maybe it already was. But uh, I, I think that thinking through about like who your off taker uh, for your, your offsets or are going to be, is going to be uh, is important because that may, especially if it's a public lands component or especially a state public lands component, um, that it might me be meeting within some state uh, uh, emissions reductions goals. Great, thanks. Uh, and I see we just have a few minutes left, so maybe we'll do one last question. I think we actually just have one one final question from the Q&A. So um, I think, and I believe it's in a couple of parts. So if a given landowner tries to group projects across fires, that's possible in theory, but can lead to tricky situations with start dates and eligibility requirements under the existing protocols. Uh, I'm just curious if any of our established GHG schemes are looking at making the rules more flexible to allow a given landowner to group across fire events or potentially allow landowners to team up. Um, and I think that kind of gets to uh, another question. I know, you know, a lot of you are looking at uh, larger projects that maybe cross ownership borders. Um, and. I guess just getting your thoughts around um, the challenges that you see there, and and uh, how maybe you've been able to work some of the through some of those issues. And uh, I'll just also comment that, at least under our climate forward reforestation methodology, we do allow for uh, such types of aggregations to occur. Um, it's just a matter of getting uh, agreements from all the landowners to essentially have a single project developer assigned the the and they can be doled out from, from within there. Well, my thunder there, John. I was going to say project aggregation can occur. Um, even if without without project aggregation, you know, across multiple, if it's a single landowner, you just have to be a little bit more deliberate about it, but it's a very doable thing. Um, mm -hmm. um, but back to the point of project aggregation, which is, I think it's essential um, because when I talked about like the three buckets of landowners, the small landowners, like the only way that we get to them is through project ag aggregation. Um, and so Climate Forward has, a, I think uh, ACR has some uh, some components of aggregation there as well. Um, so it's a doable thing. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, and I guess at this point, I'd, I'd invite any of you, if you have any final comments, we're just about at the end of the hour. So if any of you have any final comments, any words of inspiration, uh, feel free. Otherwise, we can wrap things up. I'll just say thanks, John, for the opportunity and, and look forward to catching up with any, anyone who has questions. I agree, John. Thanks. We always like talking about reforestation. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you all for participating in today's panel uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks to the audience for joining the session. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank